Ever since the inception of the Christian Church, there have remained controversies over how the laws of the Bible are to be understood and applied in the lives of those who accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. This controversy exudes from the content found in the Pentateuch, or Law of Moses, and its teachings in regards to morality, sacraments, feast days, and even societal or judicial laws that some would find concerning in a postmodernist era of political thought. Despite various understandings of the law within the church itself, there are some who consider themselves to be outside of the church, yet who believe in Jesus Christ or Yeshua the Messiah, and that no changes to the law have been or can be made, and that observance of circumcision and the ceremonial feasts must still be observed to this day. From the early Nazarenes and Ebionites to the more modern forms of Messianic Judaism or Torah and Hebrew Roots movements, the common argument made is that there can be no categorical distinctions made in regards to the law, that just as we understand you shall not murder to be a moral precept, it is equally applied to the entire law of God. In this video, we will be refuting this notion and will be defending the Reformed Calvinist position on the law's distinctions. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law, yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in thy way. Establish thy word unto thy servant, who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach which I fear, for thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Scripture uses the word law in many different ways. The term law, or in Hebrew, Torah, can be used in the general sense of direction, teaching, or instruction. Receive, I pray thee, the law, or instruction, from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. The law can even refer to the covenant between God and Israel, as we see in Exodus, and he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord hath said we will do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. In the book of Romans, Paul uses the word rather flexibly. It could be from the Ten Commandments to even individual laws. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. O no man anything, but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 21, Paul uses it to refer to the special revelation of the Old Testament by saying, In the law it is written, and proceeds to quote Isaiah the prophet. In its most basic sense, Torah is similar to its root verb, yara, to project or point out, for it points out or instructs us regarding Jehovah's perceptive will. In this video, in order to avoid confusion, I will be referring to the law broadly as to anything that is commanded by God in the Bible. One of the things which vastly separates the Calvinists from the Baptist, Fundamentalist, and Dispensationalist Christians is our tendency towards theonomy and our high regard for the Law of Moses. We believe that there are three categorical distinctions within the law found within Scripture, that being moral, ceremonial, and civil. Due to limited time, we will primarily discuss the moral and ceremonial laws and their distinctions. God's moral law has existed from the very beginning. When Adam, our forefather, was created, he entered into a covenant of works with God, wherein he was in a state of probation. Had he obeyed God's commandment to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, both he and his posterity would have lived. But as the result of his sin, he brought death upon himself and upon his descendants, whom he represented in the garden." The Westminster Confession of Faith puts it this way in chapter 19, section 1. 
God gave to Adam a law as a covenant of works by which he bound him and all his posterity to personal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience, promised life upon the fulfilling, and threatened death upon the breach of it, and endued him with the power and ability to keep it. Nevertheless, this same moral law continued in perpetual force even today after the fall of Adam. Section 2. This law after his fall continued to be a perfect rule of righteousness, and, as such, was delivered by God upon Mount Sinai in Ten Commandments and written in two tables, the first four commandments containing our duty towards God, and the other six our duty to man. While there is certainly more than ten moral laws, the Ten Commandments serve as a summary of the moral law written by the very finger of God onto tablets of stone, all of these commandments, including the Sabbath day, are universal and morally binding. Section 5 states, The moral law doth forever bind all, as well justified persons as others, to the obedience thereof, and that not only in regard of the matter contained in it, but also in respect of the authority of God, the Creator, who gave it. Neither doth Christ in the gospel any way dissolve, but much strengthen this obligation. Despite God's moral precepts, there were other commandments that the Creator was pleased to give to the people of Israel, a church in maturity. Ceremonial ordinances consisting of worship, sacrifices, burnt offerings, and the Paschal Lamb, which served to prefigure Christ and His redemptive work on the cross, which would be foretold by the prophets. Our opponents maintain that it's impossible to argue for categorical distinctions within the law without resorting to moral relativism. The problem with this argument is that it's based upon the erroneous assumption that if any commandment comes from God, it must necessarily be moral in content. This is not based upon anything scriptural and commits the fallacy and logic known as begging the question that being a circular form of reasoning due to the conclusion being assumed within the premises. It is assumed that because the laws given by the Creator are necessarily moral in content, the conclusion is that all laws, whether circumcision, the wearing of tassels, or keeping the feasts, are universal, morally binding descriptions of His will. However, Scripture explicitly shows that not every commandment is intrinsically moral and provides an ubiquitous assemblage of examples to consider. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed me, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? So what's being established here is an unambiguous distinction between righteousness and sacrifice, hence distinctions within the commandments themselves. In other words, not all of the law is conflated as a singularity, but that some commandments complement others. Does this mean sacrifices and burnt offerings were not commanded by God? Of course they were. But to love, show mercy, and do justice was better than all the burnt offerings, because they are morally binding commandments, while the burnt offerings were not and served a different purpose. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. The point being made is that there are laws that are required to be obeyed before one is to offer the sacrifices. There are moral requirements that must be habitually followed for covenant faithfulness in addition to ceremonial ordinances. These ceremonial laws are God's positive precepts, that being commands of God which are grounded solely on the fact that God says that man must obey them. These were given to the Old Covenant people of God that typify Jesus Christ and his work of redemption or teach principles of sanctification, separation from evil, and symbolic form. 
I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. For I spake unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. Again, was it not commanded for the Israelites to practice the sacrificial ordinances and feasts? This can only mean that these laws are not exclusively moral in nature, and that the failure to uphold the moral law is an undermining of what the ceremonial ordinances referenced to. The New Testament also shows that the Jews during the time of Jesus also understood this distinction within the law. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Notice that the Lord Jesus Christ expressly approves of the scribe's statement, including the distinction he makes between sacrifices and loving God with all of one's heart. Similar distinctions are made in regards to circumcision. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. This statement simply cannot be understood unless there are principles which circumcision pointed to rather than being the principle itself. For circumcision profits if you keep the law. Which law? Well, the right of circumcision was given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17 and was further spiritually developed by Moses and the prophets. And Moses spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? Here we see a spiritual and abstract use of circumcision. Not only does circumcision apply to the lips, that is, lips in obedience to God, but we also have circumcision apply to man's heart, or his inward spiritual state. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn that none can quit it, because of the evil of your doings. The Israelites were to perceive beyond the physical right of circumcision and embrace the abstract and spiritual principles of obedience to God and love of God in their hearts. Jewish apologists will argue that this is philosophical nonsense, but as we see, the spiritual instructions are dependent on the physical right, so the Israelite people grasp the basic concept of death to the fallen self or original sin. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, and the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men." but of God. Here Paul makes the argument that the keeping of God's moral precepts credits one's uncircumcision as circumcision. His reasoning for this is that one is not necessarily a true Jew for being circumcised, but that there are moral requirements accompanied with the covenant seal of circumcision. If circumcision served as the moral requirement, then it would be redundant nonsense for Paul to distinguish circumcision from the righteous requirements of the law. Thus Paul states elsewhere, Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. We see now that the proposition of there being categories in the law is not moral relativism or Platonic philosophy, but is replete with precedence from the law and the prophets. 
Further videos on similar topics may come, but I implore the viewer to consider this issue further. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. For the Apostle, there is nothing wrong with the law, for it is holy and just and good. But the law has often been misunderstood and abused by professing Christians and heretics throughout history. We see that when properly defined and applied, the law is necessary to understand the gospel and is essential for sanctification, both personally and corporately. Thank you for watching.